There's two different wools in this picture. This is the longer wool called worsted. And that is the shorter, fluffy, fluffy wool called wool. And different technologies and different cities were built on these. You have one city based on worsted in England and one city based on wool. Uh, we'll skip that. Here's a worsted. Worsted is the fine wool, very much like cotton. And it's called the 80s. This means you can have a long stream. This, very rough, you can't make a long stream out of it. It's very hard. This is a, a, a micrograph. I'll be finished in a few minutes on this. This is a micrograph of wool, um, very small to very rough. Think of a machine. The machine would work better on this. There's little variation. But that would destroy the machine, and it would get caught in the machine all the time. Fine wool is over here, worsted, and rough wool. It's not all the same. It does not have amenability for machinery. Cotton. Cotton, on the other hand, is high technological amenability. Cotton looks the same. And cotton is very regular. Cotton is very regular, particularly if it's treated in chemicals. Um, here is, just for comparison, there is no city, there is no textile used for these. This is rough. It's, you can't do this. Um, this is artificial nylon. Humans made this. It has perfect amenability. It's exactly the same all the time, and huge amounts of money is spent on that fiber, and very little is spent on paper. There's raw silk, by the way. Silk has a long string. It's very minimal. So I argue cotton has a high geographic and high technological amenability. Because of that, you have slavery. Slavery, you don't need slaves to raise wool. You need slaves to raise cotton. There's a huge amount of cotton here because it's more minimal. And you can invest in machinery. There's no machinery. You don't put a sheet in a machine. You still have to manually cut the wool off a sheet. But a machine can manipulate something that's always the same. And over here in the background, you see these things over here? That's cotton. It's all the same. It's just waiting for a factory. And if it's not a good year, leave it there. It's going to be OK. It doesn't matter. It's not going to rot. Um, this is a picture of Manchester, the first city based on cotton textiles. This is what Karl Marx looked at in Northern England. He saw these huge mills polluting, and he thought that was the future of everything. But instead, I argue, it was the future of only cotton. Um, this is a cotton mill. Look how big it is. Because cotton can be expanded. Some of the first big buildings in the world were designed for cotton. Steel buildings, the first steel buildings in the world, were made to hold cotton. Why? Because you could expand cotton that much. Um, the first industrial soap was connected to cotton. So cotton ties a lot of the world's history together. Huge factories, whole cities based off this is the United States, uh, on cotton. In columns, cotton, wool, and worsted. In cotton, here's a small machine. Here's regular fibers, all the same, and they go into the machinery easily. And you have machinery that has high technology, high geographic ability. Uh oh, wool. Wool, it doesn't fit in a machine very well. It's too rough, too different, very different. So what do you do? You keep labor. You don't build machines. You keep hiring more people. And the sheep has lots of variety. It's unsubstitutable. You have to use it if you want that characteristic. But it doesn't have technological amenability, and you can only grow it in certain areas. Um, worsted. Worsted is wool, but it's straight. And it does have technological amenability. So there are more cities around like that. To summarize, cotton, easy to expand, one year required, more technological amenability, more geographic amenability. Result, boom and bust in the cotton trade. There's a lot more variety in the price. Wool, difficult. It only takes two or three years. There's less technological amenability. You can only grow it in a few places. However, people still want it. 
and it's used despite capitalists. Capitalists don't like it as much as, as cotton. However, there's a more stable wool trade, and there's less proletarianization. There's less of a Marxist class conflict. That's not important. This is some quantitative data for wool and worsted. Notice worsted, which is more technologically minimal, had a lot of power looms. You know, technology, technology around worsted was very consolidated in one region. There's a lot of investment in machines. But the machines were only in this special kind of long wool. If it was rough wool, yeah, there's much smaller levels. There's not that much investment, and it's very decentralized. So this is the history of wool and worsted. Decentralized wool, very centralized worsted. Um, I'll skip that. This is the last thing I'll show here. This is from 1842. This is from an old encyclopedia. And I read it, and then I classified it. In the cotton trade, to make a textile, there were only nine steps. By 1842, everything is mechanized. Karl Marx is writing in this period, and he sees this highly mechanized world. The worsted trade, mm, this is longer. There's some that's mechanized, but a lot of it is mixed. It depends. You know, if it's good sheep gear, maybe it's more mechanized. If it's a bad sheep gear, you can't use those machines. So it depends. The majority is mechanized with qualifications or a mix. And, you know, 7%, 41% is totally unmechanized. People still needed labor. And this is the same era, 1842, 1842. Only cotton is consolidated. The wool trade, very decentralized. Mechanized, the smallest amount is mechanized. And if you total all these, 70%, is mechanized or totally unmechanized. So wool remained unmechanized. Uh, I have to skip all these things. Um, I did want to show that I found similar patterns in the United States. Woolen city of Philadelphia, very decentralized. Cotton city of Lowell, Massachusetts, very centralized. Um, this is from Italy. This contradicts Marx, Karl Marx's idea that there be more conflict in cotton. Uh, instead, this is the total number of strikes by sector. And wool, wool, more decentralized, is more contentious. So think about that. Instead of a large hierarchy creating contention, contention is on the decentralized level. The cotton has some of the lowest or lower strikes and is more consolidated. I said, said uh, technology determinist discourse. Some people think that oh, technology is abstract. I'm critiquing this. Uh, I'm also critiquing a free trade idea and I'm critiquing the Marxist discourse of abstract unionization. I said. We have seen in all three areas nothing abstract about them. They are intimately and dependently connected to particular raw materials. And these three issues, you know, technology, trade, and conflict, are raw material specific, I kind of argue. And that's all we have time for today, so I will continue macro theories next time. Uh, where I will talk a bit about changes in large cultural issues. We'll talk about Karl Jaspers, and I'll talk about my other book, Ecological Revolution. We'll talk about eco-Marxism, and we will talk about ecological modernization. And if we have time, we'll watch one small film related to that. All right, thank you for staying a little bit later. And if I could get your attendance on this sheet, that would be great. Thanks very much. Any questions or comments? So hopefully this is a start of inspiring you to think about materials connected to human societies 
and not thinking of materials as outside of human society. 